Coming up on today's edition of Airborne, there's a new ADSV on the block. Kissimmee, Florida will soon be home to a new Italian LSA. And the Army scouts a new Hilo. I'm Ashley Hale. Welcome to Airborne on Aero TV. Pilots of light sport and experimental aircraft will welcome the news that Dynon Avionics is now shipping the SV ADSB 470 UAT band traffic and weather receiver for the Skyview system. This remotely mounted receiver module integrates with the Skyview system to provide easy access to weather and traffic information on top of the detailed navigational information that Skyview already provides. All information displayed is free with no monthly subscriptions, based on the FAA's ADSB broadcast in the USA. Weather is displayed graphically and textually on Skyview and includes NEXRAD radar, METARs, and TAFs. Airport weather data can be chosen based on nearest or by airport identifier. Additionally, when paired with an ADSB out capable SVXPNDR 26X mode S transponder, the SV ADSB 470 receives a full traffic portrait from the FAA ADSB system. At an MSRP of $995, the SV ADSB 470 is an affordable permanently mounted ADSB in solution, which has been designed specifically for experimental and light sport aircraft. However, the SV ADSB 470 is only suitable for use in the US with the FAA's ADSB system, as it receives its data via the US only 978 MHz UAT frequency. So that means it will not receive traffic, weather, or TFRs in other countries. Italico Aviation USA, a spinoff of the Italian ultralight builder Eurola, is opening an LSA manufacturing facility at Kissimmee Gateway Airport. When the facility is established, Italico Aviation USA will be the only original equipment manufacturer of light sport aircraft in the United States. The aircraft to be built in Florida will be called the FX-1. It will be based on the Eurola Jet Fox Ultralight. The company plans to create 55 new positions over the next four years, with more than a $3.2 million capital investment. The site will also serve as a distribution center for all their sales in the Western Hemisphere. Eero Spinozzi, president of Italico Aviation and Italico Aviation USA, says, quote, We are excited to begin manufacturing in the United States. The Kissimmee location is perfect as it offers us access to everything we need, from a great workforce, strategic location, a tremendous customer base, and most importantly, the Florida sunshine that enables us to showcase our planes year round. The U.S. Army's long-serving OH-58 Kiowa Warrior Scout helicopter may be on its way out. According to Reuters, Army officials are backing a plan to replace the aging Hilo, which first flew in Vietnam, rather than extend its service life. The major players are already lining up with proposals for the replacement aircraft. Boeing says it will offer an armed version of the AH-6 Little Bird. Interest has also been expressed by Eurocopter, Bell Helicopter, Augusta Westland, MD Helicopters, and AVX Aircraft. If a new procurement program does go forward, it would be the third such effort in a series dating back to 2004. Light Squared has popped up on the radar once again, and at this time, the company is proposing to share Spectrum with NOAA weather balloons. The company entered bankruptcy earlier this year after its original proposal to establish a wireless 4G LTE data network was found to cause unacceptable interference with the GPS. According to the government technology website, LightSquared has proposed that it be allowed to share frequencies at 1675 to 1680 megahertz, which is just above its approved satellite bandwidth 
for terrestrial transmitters it says are necessary for the network to be viable. The spectrum is currently used by NOAA for data transmission from weather balloons. Lightsword said its operations would not be disruptive to those operations. The FCC says interested parties must file petitions to deny or comment no later than December 17, 2012. Trig Avionics, the ADSB experts, have announced another partner product compatible with their TT31 and TT22 transponders. The FAA recently approved a TT31 Trig transponder in conjunction with an Accord Technology NextNav Mini GPS unit. This follows a successful flight test program carried out near Denver, Colorado by Peregrine. This new addition to TRIG's STC program allows operators to fit a TRIG TT31 transponder for a 2020 ADSB mandate ready solution. A TRIG transponder is often the simplest upgrade path for most airplane types. With a TRIG tray fitted, it becomes the hub of a 2020 ADSB compliance system. Configured for ADSB, the TT31 provides a certified 1090 ES ADSB out. Having a certified out is necessary to receive TISB ground transmissions. How Adams of Accord Technology said, quote, We're delighted to partner with Trig Avionics. Their transponder technology is a great match for our certified WAS Egnos GPS equipment. This latest STC demonstrates how ADSB technology is here today and can be fitted and operated with confidence. The U.S. Navy has responded to claims by the Iranian government that it has captured an unmanned aircraft by saying that all of its drones are accounted for, but they leave open the possibility that it may have been a scan eagle that had been lost previously and retrieved from the ocean by Iran. The Associated Press reports that there were no details as to time, date, or location of the supposed UAV capture. A video released by Iranian state television shows two people in military uniforms examining what appears to be an intact Scan Eagle UAV. U.S. officials say it may have been in their possession for some time and only revealed now for its propaganda value. You're watching Airborne, more in a moment. Since its inception, Redbird Flight Simulations has been dedicated to developing new training technologies and processes in an ongoing effort to make aviation safer, more affordable, and more accessible. Consider Redbird's flagship flight training device, the FMX, a superior quality, full-motion, feature-rich advanced aviation training device priced with real-world flight training organizations in mind. With standard features that are anything but standard, such as wraparound visuals, a fully enclosed cockpit, quick change configurations, scenario-based training compatibility, and of course, an electric motion platform, the FMX serves up a level of realism that is simply unavailable in other training devices on the market. For more information on Redbird Flight Simulations, the Redbird FMX, and Redbird's entire line of flight training devices, visit www.redbirdflightsimulations.com. Welcome back. If you'd like to suggest a story for Airborne Aero TV, our website or podcast, drop us an email to news-spy at aero-news.net. The first Airbus A350 is learning to walk before it can learn to fly. Airbus has successfully completed the main structural assembly and system connection of A350 XWB MSN-001, the first flight test aircraft. The aircraft, on its wheels for the first time, recently moved out of the main assembly hall, Station 40, at the A350 XWB final assembly line in Toulouse. It then entered the adjacent indoor ground test station, Station 30. The assembly work performed in Station 40 included the successful electrical power on of the aircraft's entire fuselage and wings. Soon, work in Station 30 will start, 
by testing the aircraft's hydraulic system, followed by the full electric and hydraulic power on of the aircraft, which will be completed by around the end of the year. After the A350 XWB MSN-001 exits Station 30, the aircraft will go through a series of extensive production and certification development tests. It will also be painted and have its engines installed. It will then be delivered to the flight line and be readied for its first flight in mid-2013. It's not every day that the death of a spider makes the news. However, on Monday, the Smithsonian National Museum of Natural History said that Nefertiti, the spider knot, which had spent 100 days in space, has died of natural causes. Nefti was introduced to the public on Thursday, November 29th, after traveling in space on a 100-day, 42-million-mile expedition en route to and aboard the International Space Station. She had made the trip as part of an experiment conceived by a student to study how she would react to microgravity. Nefti lived for 10 months. The lifespan of the species, the Phytopus johnsoni, can typically reach up to one year. In a news release, the museum said, quote, The loss of this special animal that inspired so many imaginations will be felt throughout the museum community. The body of Nefti will be added to the museum's collection of specimens, or she will continue to contribute to the understanding of spiders. It's time once again for Jim Campbell's barnstorming commentary. Today, Jim is concerned about getting LSAs on the right track. Thanks, Ashley, and hi, folks. Well, let's talk about something that's been uh, bandied around by us for quite some time, a segment of the industry that holds tremendous potential, possibly pivotal potential, and for some reason or another, really isn't finding the market, isn't finding its way, and to a certain extent, has been put forth for all the wrong reasons in all the wrong ways. And then we're talking specifically about light sport aircraft. Light sport aircraft as an offshoot of uh, various programs uh, postulated by USUA and EAA and to a certain extent USHGA and a number of organizations over the years was supposed to be an entry level basic aircraft that people could afford to own and fly and operate above and beyond anything that was heretofore available. EAA saw this as this great membership opportunity and just beat the bushes about how great LSA was going to be. And before you knew it, the basic onus was that there were going to be these twenty and thirty thousand dollar, you know, hundred knot LSAs flying around every corner. It didn't happen. And it's not going to happen, at least not in that way. The typical LSA is north of $100,000. Some of them are pushing well north of $150,000. It's still an expensive proposition, and aviation, let's face it, will always be. But the promise of LSA from a standpoint of lessened complexity, lessened overall expense, better ownership experience, uh, more ability for a person to do things that they want to do with a nice recreational airplane, the possibilities are greater now than they've ever been if the industry will, one, get rid of all the nonsense and the hype and the errant uh, promises and start talking realistically not only about what LSA is, but what LSA can be with proper organization guidance and so forth. The reason we're doing a new sport plane resource guide geared solely to LSA is because there's so much confusion and hype and nonsense out there that we think the book is about the only thing that we personally can do to kind of cut through the nonsense. But the industry really needs to do it. Now, not every LSA is going to cost $150,000, and there are some surprisingly good values in the $70,000, $80,000, dollars area, and even a couple in the forty dollars or fifty dollars of somewhat limited reach or limited market share. And the airplanes that they build now are really very attractive, very neat little birds. The fact of the matter is, though, is that the industry has no clue about how to sell itself. It needs to get some marketing smarts. It needs to get some centered way for the industry to come together and put together a message that is concentrated, professional, and effective, something it's never been able to do before. We're hoping, as I said, to bring some clarity to LSA, but ultimately down the line, what we're really going to need to do is for the LSA community to get smarter, more professional, more honest, and more organized. 
We'll have a lot more to say about that in the future, but we'd love to get your uh, thoughts about what LSA means to you, what you've thought about it, why you got involved, didn't you get involved. Please share. We're looking forward to hearing from you. For the Aero News Network, Airborne, and of course, Aero TV, I'm Jim Campbell. Finally, today on Airborne, leave it to the good old TSA to play the Grinch at Christmas time. And as a result, there may be no snow globes in Whoville this year. Passengers planning to bring a snow globe on a plane this holiday season might want to consider shipping the item instead. TSA recently changed its guidelines concerning the transport of snow globes and carry-on luggage. TSA states that it will permit snow globes that appear to contain less than 3.4 ounces. Reed Grossnickel, president of Denver-based Snow Globe Central, says the most common size globe made in the U.S. is a 4-inch dome, and that size dome carries about 16 ounces of liquid. Far more than a can of soda, and far more than the TSA allows. Thus, it will not be allowed in carry-on luggage. Rather than risk the confiscation of your snow globe, and who wants to trust a TSA agent to guesstimate what 3.4 ounces looks like, they recommend you pre-ship your snow globes or pack them securely in your checked luggage. We'll get comprehensive, real-time, 24-7 coverage of the latest aviation and aerospace stories anytime at aero-news.net. I'm Ashley Hale. Thanks for watching.